United States forces have struck two telling blows against the Japanese in the Far East. The Army reports this morning from Manila that its planes raided the Philippine town of Vigan, where Japanese troops had established a beachhead and destroyed 26 Jap planes. Japanese fuel and military supplies also were destroyed. Admiral Thomas C. Hart reports the second success with the announcement that American submarines have made two successful attacks. A third sub-attack failed, and that's all the Admiral would say. He explained that submarines don't have to report on their missions until they return to their bases, but he had received advance information on these three attacks. Manila itself now has had no air raids for two days. As for the attack on two small Hawaiian islands by Japanese ships or submarines, the Navy indicates that it isn't going to be enticed away from its search for a real battle with the Japanese fleet by such tactics. And the latest information from the Far East is that the Marines still are gallantly defending those two tiny specks of American soil in the Pacific Ocean, Wake and Midway Islands. The Japanese are driving fanatically down the Malayan Peninsula, says London. They are still hundreds of miles from the British base of Singapore, but they're threatening Penang, the principal city in northwestern Malaya. The other big, big uh, British naval base in the Far East, Hong Kong, reports aerial attacks by the Japanese and artillery fire from the mainland. However, the Hong Kong defenders report they have silenced some of the guns the Japs have turned on Hong Kong. Singapore announces Japanese landings in British Borneo, but the English troops already had withdrawn, destroying vital oil wells, refineries, and other important installations. The Red Army keeps on pushing the Germans back from the Moscow front. Today, the recapture of Kalinin is announced and the Russians say they routed six Nazi divisions in the battle. The remnants of these German units are being pursued. The Berlin radio says, quote, German troops are shortening their lines in various sectors on the Russian front, unquote. Here in New York, the city council has passed a stiff law regarding violations of air raid alarm rules. A $500 fine, six months imprisonment, or both may be imposed for failure to obey, obey Air raid wardens during an attack, failure to take cover during a raid, failure of motorists to park cars and take shelter. The Admiralty in London says that an Italian general and 19 other officers were aboard a submarine sunk in the Mediterranean. The general was not among the 53 survivors who were made prisoners, the British said. The Japanese island of Formosa has been shaken by an earthquake. That's the official report of the Tokyo radio, which says that 190 persons were killed 164 injured. A Dutch airplane has scored a direct hit on a Japanese destroyer. This was announced in a communique from Batavia. The communique said all Dutch planes returned safely. This Christmas season, delight your family every day with real Ward's Tip Top Cake. Tip Top in quality, Tip Top in enjoyability. The wide variety of Ward's fruit cakes assures a festive treat for every taste at prices for every pocketbook. And don't fail to get Tip Top Wine Loaf, Tip Top Silver Queen, Tip Top Chocolate Layer, to mention only a few of the delicious Ward's Tip Top Cakes. Above all, make this Christmas feast one your family won't forget by ordering Ward's Paradise Fruit Cake today, a matchless holiday institution. In its beautiful reusable blue and white Wedgwood style container, Paradise Fruit Cake is the distinctive Christmas gift, too. Order it. And get plenty of Ward's Tip Top Cakes from your grocer today. Give your family a Tip Top Christmas season. This is Glenn Riggs inviting you to listen in to the morning news of the world at 8.45 tomorrow morning on WJZ, presented by the makers of Ward's Enriched Tip Top Bread. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Come in, San Francisco. London apparently is gloomy about Hong Kong holding out. But the latest word from the colony itself is that Americans there are all right and that its fortifications are strong enough to resist all efforts at invasion. A mile away on Kowloon mainland, three Japanese gun positions are pictured as silenced and air raid casualties are described as light so far. Perhaps the heaviest battle of the Far Eastern Theater is being waged on the Northwest Malaya Front. There, the Nipponese are smashing forward in a drive aimed at Singapore. The Pacific coast is being educated in the ways of war today. Civilians up and down the stretch of seaboard are busy memorizing rules, what to do in an air raid alarm, 
how to spot Japanese planes, where to go if injured, how to deal with fire bombs, and do your Christmas shopping early as that new meaning. Shop before noon. The stores are opening earlier in the morning, closing earlier in the evening. Last night, a familiar sight before the war came back to San Francisco. The cheerful glow of neon lights, the business district's coat of many colors, was restored to the city. This after a neon blackout of over a week. Those now in operation conform to the new ordinance. They no longer run on time clock devices and can now be put out manually at the moment the warning signal sounds. Governor Olson has called on California's legislature to convene a special session on Friday to make appropriations for the state guard and augment the state's emergency fund. Meanwhile, San Diego has put up a portion of its state guard on a war footing, calling several hundred men to full-time duty. The people in the San Francisco area have learned that blueprints for constructing home bomb shelters will soon be released to the public. The plans are said to be simple enough for the average householder to use in making his own at a cost of about $150. Incendiary bombs have been rushed to the city by the Army experts so that picked squads of firemen, policemen, and other city employees can see actual demonstration of the handling of the fire bombs. Civilian groups also will be taught protection against war gases and how to form protective squads for industrial plants. While this program takes form, electricians have begun installing eight huge air raid sirens at elevated points throughout the city. Incidentally, if an air raid alarm should be sounded in the morning before school starts, the all-clear is not sounded before 8 a.m., there will be no school that day. Not business as usual, but Christmas as usual is the slogan of the hour. Come Harajito or high water, Santa Claus is coming to town on the West Coast. The people along the Pacific are busy wishing each other a happy, not a jappy, New Year. Mayor Rossi of San Francisco has announced that the city by the Golden Gate will celebrate Christmas as usual. Civilian defense authorities are on record with a statement that there is no reason for canceling Yuletide parties. However, three suggestions have been made. One, to be sure the gathering place for the get-together can be blacked out. The second, have all the guests come before dark. Ask all the guests to arrive at varying times if the fare is large enough to create traffic congestion. And now here's a late bulletin just handed me from Chongqing. Chinese forces are reported to have delivered successful attacks north of besieged Hong Kong compelling the Japanese to shift reinforcements to cope with a Chinese threat to that rear. This is the NBC Newsroom in San Francisco. We take you now to the Newsroom in Washington. This is Morgan Beatty in Washington. The economic wing of our fighting force has revealed for the first time the fact that Japan is not going to starve to death in this war, at least not any time soon. These economic soldiers, and they are soldiers as important in the long run as fighting men, have studied for several years the productive capacity of our potential enemies. These nations have all been rated, and these ratings are carefully backed up with facts and nothing else. Today, the experts disclose that Japanese probably cannot be starved by a naval blockade. Japan is self-sufficient in food. Our economists have noted Japanese reports of rice shortages. These deceptive reports apparently have been circulated to get the Japanese people ready for rationing, and to make us think there is a food shortage in Japan. The most careful authorities on economic warfare rate Japan fifth and last among the great powers, but they have reached the astounding conclusion that Japan is also self-sufficient in steel and iron, thanks to heavy American imports of scrap in the past and their own sources, and German ersatz machinery has played a part in that too. That means Japan is weak in four essentials of war, oil, aluminum, tin, and rubber. She is weakest of all in oil resources, and that cannot be stressed too often. Military economists, for that reason, point to Burma and Borneo as the logical points for Japan to strike hard in the near future. Known Burmese oil production is about a million tons a year. Borneo production, about the same. Japan produces about two million tons a year, including synthetic products that Germans have shown them how to make. She has stored much oil, too, but how much is not known. This leads the economists to believe that Japan has no more than a year of high-speed, all-out warfare under her belt. However, these economists warn us not to assume Japan cannot fight for more than a year. Japan is not now fighting all out. She can keep up the kind of war she is now conducting for several years. The Japanese are practicing hit-and-run warfare for the moment. They're trying to make each expeditionary force count to the hilt with an absolute minimum risk of their fleet and their reserve defense forces. 
Naval experts qualified to gauge Japanese strategy constantly refer to our submarine force. The Japanese naval authorities are aware of this force, so there's no use keeping it secret. Today, we scored two conspicuous victories with our sub, but it cannot yet be told exactly what these successes were. Tokyo is boasting about their knowledge of our submarines for some reason. The Japs say they know we have 20 long-range submarines operating in waters near Japan, and these submarines are capable of guerrilla tactics. That means the Japanese think they are independent of our fleet, perhaps. We're letting them think what they please. Incidentally, the experts are aware of the very clever type of propaganda warfare the Japanese are waging. It is effective only if the reading and listening public in this country relaxes in its duty. And that duty is to avoid jumping at weird conclusions based on Japanese propaganda. Take today's clever Tokyo release. The Japanese tell us they have broken the encirclement of Japan by the capture of Guam. If you take a hasty look at the map and see how close is Guam to Japan, you might be tempted to agree that this is a great Japanese victory. But if you're careful, you will realize the apparent purpose of that statement is to trap Americans into conceding that we have been trying to encircle Japan. We have never tried to encircle Japan. As for Guam, our own naval communiques merely say Guam has probably been captured. The conquest of tiny Guam, even if the Japanese have taken it, has no strategic importance to us whatever. It is too close to Japan for us to worry about at this stage of the war game. In other words, we are not going to risk large sections of our fleet right under the noses of Japanese air power until our strategists get good and ready to do that. They may be ready to do it tomorrow. They may not be ready for a year or longer. Nobody except the high command knows it, and nobody is going to reveal it. That's all for now. NBC has brought you up to the minute on the news with bulletins from New York, the latest in the Pacific Theater from San Francisco, and Morgan Beatty speaking from Washington. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Good evening, everyone. This is John W. Vandercook speaking for Alka-Seltzer, bringing you the news of the world. In the Philippines today, the American and Filipino forces have generally successfully taken the offensive. The three small fragments of Luzon, which the Japanese have taken and still hold, at the uppermost and lowest tips of that big island, have all been under American attack. At a captured Philippine airfield near Vigan, 25 Jap planes at once were caught napping on the ground and raked into uselessness by machine gun fire and by well-placed U.S. bombs. Also, somewhere or other, we are not told exactly where, American submarines have drawn their first blood against ships flying the flag of the rising, or is it setting sun? Elsewhere, the Japs have gained. Invading troops have secured several firm footholds on the coast of British Borneo in the state of Sarawa, and the British have there been forced to destroy in retreating one of the best small oil fields in the whole of the British Empire. And now, before we take our fast nightly journeys over both of our boundary oceans for direct news from the active battle areas, here is a brief message from Charles Lyon. Nervous indigestion. Ever hear of it? Ever have it? Well, nervous indigestion is the occasional byproduct of busy days when you work hard and eat too fast and at the same time try to get a little Christmas shopping done. But there's something you can do about the distress of nervous indigestion... And that's take Alka-Seltzer. Yes, drop an Alka-Seltzer tablet or two into a glass of water like this. Now watch it sparkle and listen to it fizz. Then, drink it. See how quickly Alka-Seltzer's effervescent alkalizing solution relieves your discomfort and reduces excess stomach acid. It's pleasant to the taste, and it is not a laxative. So remember... For nervous indigestion, be wise. Take Alka-Seltzer. Get it at any drugstore. And now, the news of the world. First tonight, for direct shortwave radio reports from across the war menace Pacific Ocean, we take you now to San Francisco. From the San Francisco newsroom, we now take you across the Pacific to Chongqing. Go ahead, Chung King. Come in, Chung King. Hello.
Hello, San Francisco. Hello, San Francisco. I will be not able to pick up Chongqing yet. Ladies and gentlemen, we regret that we cannot contact Chongqing at this time. We take you now to Manila. Hello, NBC. This is Bert Zylan speaking from Manila. It is now a few moments after 9 o'clock in the morning, Philippine Daylight Saving Time. Another night of peace has been ours to enjoy. Headquarters of the United States Armed Forces in the Far East announced at 7.30 this morning that there was no change in the situation during the night. It appears that the casualty list in the sinking of the inter-island steamer S.S. Corregidor will be considerably larger than first estimates. The S.S. Corregidor, making its first trip to the southern island since the war, was loaded to the rails when she ran into a mine just outside of Manila Bay. 280 survivors have already been landed in Manila and are now under the care of the Red Cross. Complete details have not yet been released for publication. With the report yesterday that 26 Japanese planes were destroyed in Vigan, the total number of Japanese losses in the Philippines to date is 70 planes. This figure includes only those losses that have been verified by USAFI headquarters as, and does not take into consideration those planes that were brought down over isolated places, reports of which have not yet been verified. Add to this the 10 enemy transports already reported sunk or damaged by USAFI airmen, together with the many small landing barges lost in the Lingayen area when the enemy tried to land there, Add these all together, and some idea can be gotten as to how dearly the enemy is paying for her attempted invasion of the Philippines. Meanwhile, during the low in military enemy ac activities in Manila, we are making hay while the sun shines. Everywhere, huge piles of sandbags are being shaped into bomb shelters. Merchants are getting their wares properly displayed for the holidays next week and people are beginning to live a more normal life. We don't expect this inattention on the part of the enemy to last forever, but we certainly are taking advantage of the situation to consolidate our civilian forces. I am sure it will have a telling effect on public morale and discipline. This is Bert Silent now returning you to NBC. We now return you to New York. And now for a report which will come to us direct from blacked out Britain. Go ahead, London. This is London. The Admiralty announced the torpedoing in the Atlantic of the British light cruiser Dunedin. She was completed in 1919, had a displacement of about 5,000 tons, and has been doing convoy and patrol work. The only news from Libya is that in spite of bad weather, the British are maintaining pressure on Axis forces and are still making progress. Two broadcasts tonight, the third of the east. One from Spain says that the news that Japanese troops had occupied the Portuguese colony of Macau has been officially denied in Coruña. Another broadcast of interest was from Lisbon this evening, saying, or rather tonight, saying that the Council of Ministers had met to discuss the grave events which occurred in the Portuguese colony of Timor. They stated that they are waiting for further details before making an official announcement of the country and clarifying their attitude in the matter. There is no official information available here as to what event this statement refers. Timor is an island off the southeastern tip of Java. Black markets are a black menace to the lives of thousands of people, affecting what people are able to buy as a result of black market prices. There's now a real hope that the profiteers and racketeers will be dealt with in their own language, money and profit. The government has decided to take the profit out of this racket. As yet, Imprisonment without the option of a fine has not been provided among the penalties. Power to seize suspect goods and dispose of them at legal prices has been. Up to the present, profiteers have been able to pay imposed fines when caught and walk out of court with an interesting profit in their pocket. The government's plan is to take that fun out of the business and dry it up. For instance, in a recent case, a racketeer's profit was about $8,000. His fine was roughly $524. Under the new orders, uh, the offender for this same case would be liable to a fine of $124,000, and that's taking the profit out of the black market. We return you now to New York. 
There has been a slight, but probably not specially significant, lull today in the dangerous fighting which is going on in British Malaya. Oddly, the Japanese themselves now take a not too, not too optimistic view of that campaign. War Premier Tojo today informed Tokyo's rubber stamp parliament, the Japanese Diet, that the neutralization of the powerful Singapore base would take a long time. Tojo did not even say its capture. Singapore's jungle background on the Malayan mainland, Tojo said, would favor the defense of the island itself. Nevertheless, the Premier said that the Jap invaders of Malaya from the north are breaking stubborn British resistance. And Singapore, though of course in more temperate language, more or less agrees. Enemy reinforcements are still arriving, presumably by sea. The Japanese swarm now in the upper part of that sweltering hot peninsula. Now numbers more than 20,000 men. For the moment, the hardest Japanese blows in that area, it appears, are being directed at the less familiar British Malay city of Penang which the British say plainly is in great danger. Penang, like Singapore, is also an offshore island. It, too, has a big airfield, naval anchorages, and supply depots, and big stores of oil. Though Penang lies 400 miles up the peninsula, it is on the far side. It therefore faces toward British India. If enemy planes could get established there, they could overlook with ease the beginning of the wide strait that funnels to only a narrow channel when it passes Singapore an ocean passage through which an enormous proportion of the world's sea trade still sails, including, for example, many of the American vessels which, before we went to war, were delivering lease lend aid to Britain at the Red Sea ports, and which, on their way back, were peaceably fetching us rubber, tin, quinine, and other useful products from the ports of those warm Malayan seas. And now, for a report from our own capital, we take you to Earl Godwin in the newsroom in Washington. And good evening, folks. A tremendous shake-up, and the whole Hawaiian command has just been ordered. War and Navy departments do not wait for the official investigation, but swing axes hard and effectively. Changes in command come on the heels of the announcement by the Secretary of Navy, Mr. Knox, that someone had been asleep at Pearl Harbor. Rear Admiral Kimmel is relieved of the command of the United States fleet. Admiral Chester V. Nimitz will take over, and Vice Admiral William S. Pye immediately takes over the fleet until Admiral Nemitz can get there. As this smashing change shakes Washington and the whole Navy, the Secretary of War, Mr. Stimson, replaces General Walter C. Short with General Dela C. Emmons, who will take over command of the Hawaiian Department. And he puts Air Corps General C. L. Tinker in command of those air forces, relieving General Frederick L. Martin. The War Department release just out says, these, these changes are made in view of the preliminary report of the Secretary of the Navy, with whose views as to the unpreparedness of the situation December 7, the Secretary of War concurs, and to expedite the reorganization of the air defenses of the defenses of the islands. On the Capitol Hill, the low age draft limit will be 21 as far as the House is concerned. 21 to 44 is the range for service in the bill the House passed tonight and sent to the Senate where it runs head-on into the Senate's own bill of a 19-year limit. The President had sent letters recommending the 19-year induction, but as a matter of fact, his letter did not reach the Military Affairs Committee of the House until after their bill had been reported and ready for discussion. Evidently, one of these things that it seems to need a good long soaking before the House could be indoctrinated. The vote against 19 age was a heavy one, 173 to 52. But there were no negative votes as the bill passed finally, but a cloakroom opinion indicates the House might be induced to change its mind, might go up a notch, and eventually compromise with the Senate at age 20. The President of the United States today told labor and industry, but we must do perfectly unheard of things. He said this to the High Council of Labor and Industry gathered here to effect a wartime program of all work and no strikes. The President puts it on a must basis. The country, he said, expects it in a hurry. And then, as he bade them goodbye, the president warned, We have not won the war by a long shot. It is going on for a long time, and that's all from Washington at this time. We'll return you to John W. Vandercook for some more late news in just a moment, right after we review this easy ABC lesson. Alka-Seltzer's ABC for Cold Distress. If you have a cold, it will pay you to remember A, Alka-Seltzer. Start to take it at once according to the directions inside each package. B, be careful. Get more rest than usual. 
Stay out of drafts, avoid stuffy, overheated rooms, dress comfortably, and get your daily quota of vitamins. And C, comfort the sore throat caused by your cold by gargling with Alka-Seltzer. So there you have it, Alka-Seltzer's ABC for cold distress. Try it when you need it, won't you? Be sure to listen later this evening to that amazing program, The Quiz Kids, sponsored also by Alka-Seltzer. Consult your local newspaper for time and station. Now, back to the newsroom. Tokyo, Japan's outpost island of Formosa, which is believed to be a base for much of Japan's present sea campaigning, today received a hard blow from an unexpected direction. Formosa, the camphor island, was rattled to its sea foundations by a severe earthquake. About 200 were killed, hundreds of houses were knocked down, and Japan bitterly complains that railways and other important communications were severely damaged. And that's the news of the world. This is John W. Vandercook speaking for Alka Seltzer, saying goodbye until tomorrow at this same time. This is the Red Network of the National Broadcasting Company. <laughs>